Welcome, welcome. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Happy long week Friday. I'm really glad to be here today with Jamie Billings. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, A Girl with an Odyssey, which is the first piece that we just heard, which is on her new CD called Sugar, uh, and talk about her work as a sound designer, soundtrack composer for games and other stuff. Uh, so welcome everybody. Um, I want to mention I met Jamie online uh, through, I think it was Instagram. I found a picture of a young woman sitting on her bed with a, an odyssey and I found this very compelling um, and I reached out and said, who are you and why do you have an odyssey? <laughs> and uh, so we started conversing and uh, it's been uh, a lot of fun and definitely one of the highlights of my online experiences. So uh, we're going to ask her a couple of questions. Uh, and like we do for all of the archive lives, we'll have an opportunity for you, the audience, to answer questions as well. So uh, anyway, welcome. are you drinking tea right now? Because I, I have um, a cup of tea yeah. in honor of you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I have a cup of tea in honor of you. I so, am drinking tea. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this is... Uh, You've developed a very strong online persona, and this is one of the things about you that I caught on right away because I'm a tea lover. Uh, so tell me, up, what's up with the tea? Um, well, I've always kind of drank a lot of tea. My mom always drank tea, and growing up it was like, I mean, just whenever I was sick, it was just kind of like I would drink chamomile tea. Um, but then as I got older, it was just something that, I don't know, maybe it like reminded me of home or something. I just started drinking a lot of tea. And then... Um, Maybe about a year ago, I was moving back to Boston from New York City, and I was looking for work. And before I got um, hired at Harmonix, I got hired at a tea shop. So that's a weekend gig when there isn't a pandemic. I work at Mem Tea. So I love tea. Yeah, me too. It, it uh, warms the heart and cools the body, I think. Or maybe it's... Yeah. Little, yeah. All right. So, maybe um, both. <laughs> a little bit of both. Um, so... One of the things I would like to start off is tell us about your musical start. Oh, and before we go any further, I want everyone to wish her a happy birthday. Jamie turned 30 on June I did. 1st. Yeah, so thanks. What a great age to be. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's been it's been crazy so far, but um, thank yeah. you. <laughs> this is not what you were thinking your 30th year was going to be like. So no, no. not at all. Um, so yeah, tell us about our musical start. Um. So I guess um, when I was younger, um, I have uh, five things and we grew up pretty poor. Um, and so every year for Christmas, we would get a video game. And I we had um, a bunch of like old like NES like video games and Super Nintendo. So it would kind of just be like my brother would play first because he's the oldest. And then we'd all just kind of like go in order like who could play. So I'd like learn to play the entire game in full by watching him, then my next sister and everybody else. So I love the music for it, and we had this old piano, and um, it was completely out of tune, not at all in tune. And so I used to, like, listen and try to learn songs by ear, like, just, like, the melodies and stuff. So my Uncle James, who's my godfather, he has lived in New York ever since I can remember. And he had, like, a record label in the 90s. And um, when I was little, he thought it was important that we express ourselves musically, so... He was really generous and got us all piano lessons, and I hated them. And I would go. <laughs> I just remember. I like, didn't like my piano lessons either, actually, to be honest with you. Yeah, <laughs> it was just. I think it was just like I had to go with like all my sisters, and I had to wait in the waiting room, and it was just. It felt like forever because everyone had a thirty-minute lesson, so I'd be there for like over two hours. And I just remember there was this old like Mr. Potato Head like game thing and like that's I used to just like play with that for like two hours and then by the time it was time for my lesson I was just like totally brain dead but um <laughs> but I learned to read music and um I always wanted to play the flute because um in Zelda that's like one of the main instruments that kind of is there and so um when I entered uh elementary school I took like lessons with the school and did that and then uh, my brother was super into metal and he was like, he still is a really good guitarist. So I wanted to be like in Metallica. So I was just like, okay, next dream, like I'm going to be in Metallica. If Kirk Hammett ever quits, I'm ready. And like, so <laughs> I used to like steal my brother's guitar 
and uh, when he wasn't home and eventually he yelled at me when I got caught and he let me use his old like crappy Squire guitar and then um yeah from there it was um I went to Haverhill High School and we didn't have like it was just regular public school like there's like no budget at all for music but we had um one guitar class and there was just like myself and a bunch of dudes from like the high school and they would all just like I mean, I think that they would, like, kind of rag on each other a lot, but, like, as, like, a girl who was, like, 14, 15 years old, it was, like, I was just, like, either ignored or it would just be, like, oh, you suck. Like, you just suck. And you'll never get anywhere because you're a girl and, like, whatever. Like, I'm trying not to swear. But they would say nasty things. <laughs> um, but one of them said they wanted to go to Berkeley College of Music, and they said I never would get in. So, of course, that was, like, my next dream. I'm going to get into Berkeley. And you then go. I did. And, yeah, I was just, like, you know, growing up, it's just, like, that was when, like, it was more like acceptable to just be sexist. So a lot of the things that I loved were kind of like influenced by sexism, sexism in a way, because it was just, I was kind of fueled to achieve my goals based on people thinking I couldn't do it. So I got into Berkeley and from there I was just like, well, I would love to create sound and do music for video games. Cause that's kind of where I have like so much of um, my love in music. So um, I majored in electronic production design, which used to be called music synthesis. If there's anybody watching who went to Berkeley, um, I think that they changed the name in like 2010, mm. maybe. And I studied with a lot of amazing people who worked at art. I, I studied with Michael Brigida. Oh, yeah. And um, he's the best. And he just retired. So congrats to Michael on his retirement. Um, but I learned so much from him. And um, he was very patient with me. And synthesizers were like so new to me. I had no idea. I would just like, I remember we had a, like a old ARP, like 2600. And I used to like look at it and be like, oh my God, I don't even know where to begin. And he used to just go in and make these crazy sounds. And I was just like, I just want to be able to like control this. And that was always just like the goal. So ARPs were always like really intimidating to me. But then, I don't know, I started to love synthesizers because of that. So that's great. You had quite, you had quite an amazing uh, group of teachers there, if I, if I recall. Um, you were there. So you were there, what, 15 years ago? No. Oh my gosh, I don't even know. I, I studied there um, no, that, 2008, no, that would 2012. Be, no, about 10 years ago. Yeah, Yeah. like, uh, when did it, what year is it? <laughs> I studied there 12 years ago I started, yeah. <laughs> the year that never should be, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, that's amazing. Um, you know, it's, I, I find it a little disheartening to think, see that your generation is still hearing about sexism in music. I, You know, I, yeah. uh, I, I love the synth world and the, and the people that I've met there, but I do find it uh, predominantly male and I, or apparently so. And so I'm hoping to hear from more women about synthesis. And I think that there's a, a, a whole new world that is available to us. Uh, not that it should be new, but did you happen to see Suzanne Ciani ever? Yeah. She, did she do a, yeah. Ah. She is so incredible. I remember like I met her and I didn't even realize it was her because I had gotten her she came out with um a record and I uh it was like a, a live record that she performed at uh Phil Niblock's apartment, which is this amazing avant garde artist who lives in New York City. And I got that for my birthday. This is when I used to work at Berkeley after I graduated there. This is probably like two thousand 15 or six, no, it would have been 2016. I got this for my birthday. And so I was just like, I looked her up and I, I saw all these videos of her when she was probably my age with these buklas. And I was like, Oh my God, literally like goddess of the earth, like so cool. And then I was working in the equipment room. I was like a studio support specialist at Berkeley in the EPD department. And, um, this like woman came by and she came up to me. She was like, Oh my God, like, like I, there, are, there are like no girls here. Like, where's the woman's bathroom? And I was like, oh yeah, it's just around the corner. And I didn't know it was her. And so I was wearing a, um, what shirt was I wearing? I was wearing, I was wearing some shirt with some synthesizer on it. It might have been the ARP shirt. Honestly, I have like an ARP Odyssey shirt. Yeah, it, it was probably that. And she came up to me. She was like, oh, did you go to Moog Fest? And I was like, no, I didn't go to Moog Fest. Like, you know, I've been working. I like. I saw a bunch of videos, like, did you go? And she was like, oh, yeah, I saw Grimes there. She was incredible. And she went on this, like, telling me about every single set. And I still had no idea this is Suzanne Chiani. And then she walked away. And then someone came running up to me. They were like, that's Suzanne Chiani. I was like, what? And I was like, I'm so glad I didn't know that because I would have acted like such an idiot. And then 
she came back and she, we let her in the equipment room and she was like really generous. And she's like, I want to donate some synths to you guys and like mm. so much in storage. And she was like wow. playing with all like the ARPs and stuff. And it was really cool. Like she's really cool. It's really accessible. Yeah. Yeah. So what, who are some of your influences coming from? This uh, yeah. I mean, like, I guess like growing up, like I listened to so much like prog metal and like primarily I was always like a guitarist growing up, even though when I went to Berkeley, my primary instrument was flute. Um, but so I would always listen to like growing up, like probably like 14 years old. That's like when I feel like everyone's like greatest influence, like kind of is there. I like love dream theater. I loved Metallica. I loved like thrash metal and death metal and most of like, so like dream theater was like the coolest thing in the world. And, um, so yeah, a lot of like metal bands, but then, um, I'm very inspired by hip hop as well. And after I started like working with my art odyssey i like I'm, I'm like so late to finding so many amazing artists but i found jay dilla like after i made this record and i was just like oh. how did it take me so long to find this incredible like producer but i love jay dilla i love um mark ronson's earlier stuff i love amy winehouse um so yeah a lot of artists like that i guess um i can so, i can yeah. i can hear the hip-hop a little bit in some of your some of your work yeah that makes a lot of yeah. sense um what is what do you mean um you have a, a nomaker that i know uh the unicorn princess tell me about that um well i feel like whenever i say that i had a collection of unicorn paraphernalia growing up people always like reference dodgeball because it was like a movie where some girl in it like had a bunch of unicorn stuff but i promise i wasn't copying her like growing up i um <laughs> now i had I a bunch of it. like yeah like, <laughs> um i had like a bunch of like unicorn like stuffed animals and like things like that growing up and I've always loved unicorns but not like in the like cutesy sense of them like I feel like they've become such a trend like I really love like medieval animals and beasts and things like that like I just love like mythology so I've always liked that and then I don't know I've always just said to people well I'm a princess and I love unicorns so I'm the unicorn princess so that's why <laughs> it's just kind of like a nickname that like like me and my friends would like call myself I guess when I was like younger it was like my screen name on like aim when we used aim <laughs> I thought it had something to do with gaming because there's a lot there's a there's a medieval element in, in a lot of games you know with, yeah with the idea of fantasy and and uh things like that yeah yeah I love fantasy games so that makes sense so you play guitar you play flute you play uh synthesizer with a keyboard have you ever used a flute maybe or another instrument um as an input for synthesizer yeah, I definitely, well, kind of, I, um, I try to use samples of my stuff, like, as much as I can with my art, um, and I have, like, a, an MPC 1000, like, one of my beat machines, and, um, I sample my flute a lot, and I use it in there, so it's not, like, using, like, the input necessarily, like, directly through, but, um, I do use my flute a lot with some of my music. Hmm. All right. So uh, you have a new album coming out, which we're going to hear a little bit at the end. Um, tell us about this. Yeah, so um, so I guess, like, firstly, so all the proceeds that I'm getting for it, I'm donating to um, uh, Black Lives Matters, and I've been donating as well to um, my friends as well who are out of work and who are black and who need help. So I've been doing everything I can to donate to them, and there's also a great collective called Black Visions as well. Um, so yeah, so the record, it actually came out on the first and, um, so that was something that I wrote in the year of two, what year did I write it? in 2018? And so the idea was, um, uh, so there was this, uh, website called weekly beats. And so the kind of idea of it was write a beat and fully produce it, record it, mix it, master it in one week and do that every week for a year. So I did that. And it was really challenging because it's like, I mean, I, you're thinking on your feet so much and then you have to make it like all come together. So in 2018, I did that and I was going through, I wasn't currently going through like a lot with sexism, but there had been a lot of sexism that I had gone through a couple years prior. So this was kind of like my cathartic way of working through it. I would just like work all day, come home, write a beat, go to sleep, wake up, go to work, like repeat. And um so I, for this record, I chose uh, my favorite ones and I chose 19 different ones out of, I almost did the full year's worth. I think I missed like two weeks, but so that was kind of the, um, 
direction of it. And I, it's called sugar because I went through a lot of like really sour experiences and the kind of play on words is like, oh, like stay sweet through sour experiences. So I was just trying to show that like you can still like go through horrific things and be a good person or you can good things can come from bad things. So. So it sounds like we really need this now more than ever. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Um, you've had some, somewhat of an interesting career. and uh, I know you worked at In Music Brands, is that correct? With Jennifer mm -hmm. Rushko, who's uh, on our board. She's the vice president of the, of the board, uh, Alan, um, our, Alan R. Perlman Foundation Board. Um, what did you do there? And what other kind of work have you done since Berkeley? Yeah, so... I worked at um, in music brands in I, when I graduated from college. I got hired in 2012, um, and so I got hired as a QA tester. And so back then, I worked at the Sonavox location, and um, we were over in Somerville. Um, so my job was basically all the software and hardware that we were coming out with. It was my job just to test it, and so I got to work with a lot of. Um, coders, like uh, sound designers, people that I'm still really close with today. I made like a lot of like lifelong friends there, which is really cool. And um, yeah, so I did that and I worked on a bunch of stuff with them. And then at the same time, I was also, I got hired at Berkeley after I graduated as their studio support um, specialist. And I was like one of maybe like six or seven people that helped with the studios. And we did like AV and lab, like construction and like everything. Uh, for the EPD department. So I, I was working two full time for a while. Then I was just at Berkeley. Then in 2015, I had like a really fun year and I was, um, I was like an extra, like, they were shooting the new Ghostbusters movie in Boston. So like oh, I saw an ad. Yeah. And I was like an extra for it. It was so fun. So I did that. And um, I worked for a small little like collective called Girls Make Games. And so I was uh, the camp coordinator at the Boston location, which was held at MIT. And um, I was also a sound design instructor for them. And I was a sound designer for them too. I was like doing the sound design for the games that we were teaching the, the girls to make, which is really fun. And then I worked at MIT Game Lab as their sound designer. I've been doing freelance in between all this. And then I uh, got work at NYU Tisch in their film department as their audio post-production technician, where I worked for a few years. And then I got work at Harmonix, a game studio here in Boston. So I moved back and um, I haven't been there in a while, but I like was doing some freelance, like in-house engineering at Ugly Duck Studios, which is a recording studio in Boston. Oh. And um, yeah, they're really cool. They're, their studio is really nice. Um, and I also teach online classes at Soundfly, which we teach, well, I teach um, oh, right, your music production. Yeah, so I do. I, I'm busy like so much of the time. I'm burnt out all the time. So <laughs> I just try to stay busy and pay down my student loans. So, <laughs> and I work at MMT. I work at a tea shop too. <laughs> You're a busy lady. Um, yeah. So, uh, tell us a little bit. So, your current gig is harmonics. Mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, I'd like to show everyone a couple of uh, demos that I know you have. Um, I know you can't really show what you do there exactly, but. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go ahead and take a look at one of these. All right.
some great sounds. Wow. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I know probably a lot of people are going to want to ask, how do you do that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that in a few moments. Is this like a dream come true since you're, you were inspired by games when you were young for the sounds? I think so. I mean, like, it's a, it's a really hard industry to work in just because there's like, there are so many video games, but for whatever reason, it's just so hard to find consistent work as like a sound designer or a composer. Right. Um, but it's definitely, I mean, I feel the happiest when I'm working with other creatives, especially like artists, because I'm so inspired by visuals and um, programmers as well, because it's like a chance for me to learn the more technical side of things. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely really happy to have work whenever I do. Let's, let's take a look at one more. I just this is this one's my favorite. Hold on a second. Okay. So um, I know I want to know how you do that. Um, let, I'd love to start with a little studio tour. This is what I uh, do for most people that are uh, gracious enough to allow my virtual presence in their studio. So yeah, yeah. let me show you. Okay. Um, so you get my computer. I don't want to unplug my computer. Okay. So of course we have my ARP Odyssey. So this is um, an original. It's from 1972. It's my Mark I, and that's just my baby. Um, it's only had one other owner except for me. It was owned by Doug Walker, who was in a uh, really cool band called Alien Planetscapes. So I um, bought it from his son. Doug actually passed away, I think, in 2006. Um, so, yeah, so I bought it, and I would never sell it, but I promised his son I will <laughs> never sell it. And if he ever wants it back, I will understand. <laughs> um so then I've got, so on the floor, let me see if I can show it. Uh, I'm like so bad at holding this. I don't know if you can see it, but I have like my little delay pedal and my uh, looper pedal. It's my flashback four. And I use that with um, my synthesizer. Um, so then I've got all my pedals, which are more traditionally guitar pedals. Um, I have a Game Boy, which actually you can like write music on a Game Boy, which is really cool. Um, I use a software inside a, there's like a, like the little like, cartridge that goes inside Game Boys can actually hold this software called Little Sound DJ. So it uses like the the sound chip and emulates the sort of like 8-bit sound that um, a Game Boy makes. So I, I used to use that a lot in my music. Um, got my computer, uh, got my MPC-1000, my Roland CR-5000, which is a drum machine. Um, Got my little Korg synth in the back, and of course my guitar. So that's my little studio. I have an ESQ one as well, but it's not here with me. It's like uh, in Boston. So. So you did your whole album on the, with the setup. Yeah, I did it with. Um, most of it was uh, the Art Odyssey, the MPC. Um, there were like some flute samples of mine on it too, um, but yeah, so it was all done with all this in my guitar. Very cool. So how, um, tell us about making these sounds. I mean, there was a lot of, there's a lot of subtleties that I, I found, especially in the second, uh, in the second game. Um, can you do all this with what you have here or do you do other stuff uh, where you work or how, do, how does it work? How do you uh, start making sounds and, and refine them? That's yeah, a lot so, of questions. I obviously don't know. No, no that's fine. Um, they're really good questions. So for that, um, what I do, I actually use Pro Tools to sync up all the sounds. Um, so um, 
there is like a form of uh, sound recording called Foley. So basically it's like if something's on screen and it's like, it looks like Rocky Balboa punching someone in the face when you're on set, you might not necessarily want him to actually punch him in the face. So you want to record a sound to replace that. So people don't get hurt. And, um, and for other reasons too, but um, a lot of people, like the most classic is people get like a watermelon, cut it in half and then punch like the watermelon. And then you can pitch it down a little bit to make it sound a little bit more like flesh. Um, so for those video game um, demos that I did, those were actually for a company that I wasn't hired by, but it was uh, demos for upcoming games of theirs and I was applying for a job. So um, so I ended up getting the job, but I was I was happy with the demo. So they let me post on my, my site. Um, so that company is Arrowhead Studios. So, um, so yeah, like the whole thing was they sent me those videos and they had no sound at all on them and they didn't want any music. They just wanted every single movement, every single everything that's in those videos to have a sound assigned. So I took the video, I imported it into Pro Tools, and then I did what's called a cue sheet, which is basically like, um, you can do it inside Pro Tools or you can do it like with just pen and paper, but you have like your time code and you write down the time code and every single sound that you see so that you don't miss anything. And um, so yeah, so then with actually creating it, you can do a lot of those sounds, like those like kind of laser sounds I did with them, um, a bunch of virtual instruments you can do it with analog instruments as well like just like like sound design like making presets to make it sound like crazy so i did that for a lot of those um for those like kind of bomb explosion sounds i like slammed a door pitched it down eq'd it did a bunch of weird stuff and then chopped it up and synced it to video um and then there were like some weird like atmospheric things in the back too like yeah. the first video it's like you go into like a tomb, like a mummy's tomb. So I recorded myself like breathing in a scary way into the mic and then I reversed it and I like tripled it and then I added reverb and delay to make it sound like really creepy. So a lot of times when people are doing sound design, they, they do like an amazing job with like the sounds themselves, but they forget that you're trying to also make an environment. So uh, game studios tell you always make a, an environment around you. Like don't forget your atmosphere. So that was like what I was like trying to do. Well, so yeah, I would say it's really effective. Oh, thanks. So, um, I'd like to first ask the audience um, if anyone has some questions for Jamie. I know I have a uh, probably have a lot more educated questions than my general. How do you do that? That's so cool. Questions. So uh, we have a, I have a friend from Germany. We got Peter Churchyard. Then. Uh, there seems to be a relative or so, uh, Melissa Billings. Oh, cool. Ah, hello from, from LA. That's Adrian Heredia. Heredia. I hope I said that right. And, uh, a bunch of other people have been so, ah, Jeff Kellum. Cool. So, um, does anyone have some questions for Jamie? Ah, so, uh, Than wants to know if you consider yourself more Foley or SD? Um, I guess both. Um, I have like, so much sound in general. Um, I wouldn't really say that I'm a Foley artist, even though I've done Foley for film and I've done it for uh, games. But um, with gaming, like so much of what you're doing is Foley work because um, you don't really have like the privilege of having sound that's been pre-recorded on set because your set is just in post for games. Um, but yeah, I think I think I would say like. I don't know. I mean, like, I love them both so much. Probably sound design, I think. Okay. Um, Alex Ball, who is the creator of the documentary, if you, Electromotive, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, I haven't seen it, but oh, I'll definitely watch it. Oh, it's a great, and anyone here who hasn't seen it yet, you must see it. You can find it on, um, on uh, my website, on the Alan R. Perlman Foundation website. We have a YouTube we have a video area. Anyway, uh, enough plug, plug, plug. Alex did a great job, by the way. Alex, you did a great job. He wants to know what your favorite sounds to uh, create with the Odyssey. What are your favorite sounds? I love bass sounds. I've always, like, I and I'm not a bass player at all, so I think that, like, just being able to hit really low registers and, um, I don't know, like, I, I find that, like, I can write the best if I ha start with bass for some reason. I mean, I think it makes sense on, like, a musical level, but... Um, I don't know, because I do so much looping that, like, if I have, like, a bass line I like, then I can create, like, different layers on top of it and create something that 
I don't know. I don't know. I'm very like melodic with the ARP, so. Can you show us? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, let me see. I want to make sure that you guys can see. Can you see? Um, yes, I see the Odyssey. It's like a little bit far. Let me um, see if I can get it a little bit closer. Yeah. Let me unplug my this so that we can not fall off. Okay. Let me... Like, I love, like, using resonance with it as well. Like, just, like, the crazy... I don't know. Can you hear it? Yes. Okay, cool. It's probably kind of loud because the speaker is, like, right there. Oh, I have my looper on. I didn't even realize with my delay, but that's okay. Um, the different uh, VCOs. I love like just creating like layers with it too. Um, it's I, I always like love when people are like, oh my god, like it's cool, but it's only monophonic. I'm like, it's duophonic. Like I love like just like showing people that you can do like more with the ARP than just play one note at a time. Like you can like layer it, and you can just like kind of almost like trick it to make it be duophonic. But yeah, I don't know. I always just like start like that and then I have like my MPC and I always just like write a beat and then I'll like play something with the ARP. Um, I don't know if you want me to do that, but. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Um, okay, let me, um, cause sure. I can kind of move you on the fly. This is a very DIY <laughs> sort of thing. I don't know if you can see, yeah, I think you can see my MPC. Um, yes, I'm right nodding here. like you, yes. Okay, sweet. Um, so yeah, what I do first, um, I had a sequence, so I didn't do it. So the MPC is like formatted like this and, um, you can just like create beats on the fly. So, uh, you get your like metronome. I have like two bars. Um, let me turn it up. That would help. Right. Sorry, and then of course we mess up, but that's okay. It's so quiet, hold on, I can't really hear myself. Just one second. Uh, there we go. There we go, now I can hear. So then it's like, I'll get like a beat and this obviously isn't like the most perfect, but then I will switch you over here so you can see my arm. So then, okay. And can you see my arm okay? Uh, no, just a little no, bit. No. There we go. Yeah. Okay.
yeah, that's just kind of like a random whatever improv thing. But I like to uh, to do that. I always like start with the bass and then I kind of work my way up and harmonize it. I'm like a big like harmonizer, probably from like my days of listening to like very melodic music and being like classically trained. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Now, I, it's great yeah. to hear multiple voices like that. It's cool. Uh, yeah, it's fun. So we have a good question here from Amor. Uh, what would you recommend for someone who wants to start a career on sound design? Recommendations on getting music out there for video games and soundtracks. Yeah, so um, I think anyone who wants to get into sound design, um, you know, when I went to Berkeley, I'm always like, I go between like being like, oh my God, I'm so grateful for Berkeley because like I met so many amazing people and you know, I, like whatever you like meet everybody working there and like studying there. Um, but then it's like crazy student loan debt. So it's always just like, ah, uh, like just trying to like juggle finding work in a profession that <laughs> is like tricky to find work in. And then also just like staying up to date and relevant and whatever. Um, I mean, I think like first, like if you're if you're trying to like get into sound design specifically for games, um, I started off doing uh, sound for indie games, and I still do. Um, there's a really great resource online called TIG Source, and that's kind of how I started doing music for uh, local games. And T -I -G. they do, yeah, TIG Source, and um, and so a lot of indie developers will post their works in progress and it's a great way to kind of showcase your work. And um, I got my start by working with uh, these two brothers, uh, Nathan Kling and his brother Kurt, and they had a studio called um, Shark Arm Studios. And so they had a game called The Grand Feather, and I absolutely had no idea what I was doing with sound. I was like, I don't even know what I was doing. But it was like, my whole thing was like, I don't really, I'm trying to like learn. And they were like, well, we're learning too. Like we're in college. So it was just kind of meeting like sort like different people who were in the same sort of like, plain as you but in different fields so I would definitely recommend going there and looking for uh local uh get-togethers obviously with the pandemic that probably won't happen for a really long time but Boston has a lot of different chapters there's like women in gaming and there's um just in general Boston indie games so they have like meetings and you can go meet people and network as people call it but it's a really great way to make friends as well so so networking yeah, networking, I guess mm -hmm. that's the best way. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, uh, we have uh, Sonido from Chile, and he wants to know, um, have you chosen the Mark I instead of Mark II or III for a specific reason? Um, actually, that's an interesting question because I learned to play the Art Odyssey on a, I believe it was a Mark II that we had at Berkeley. And so I was always like, oh, I want to just get that same one because I fell so in love with that synthesizer. Um, but then, I don't know, I was like on eBay and I found this one, the Mark I, and I was just like, like, I don't know, like something like resonated me about it and it was completely restored, which helped too. And so it was just cool because one of the, the people who restored it is um, uh, Centronix who uh, John Kamitsus, like he used to work at ARP. So I was just like, oh, there's so much like ARP history within this like ARP odyssey. And I also, I do like how the, it has a pitch wheel versus like the pitch pads. Right. I like felt like so in love with that. Um, and people thought I was nuts to get a vintage one at the time because they were like, why would you get that when you can just get a cord one? And I was like, well, I mean the same reason why, like if you're like a collector of like cars or whatever, you're not going to buy like a Honda Civic if you want to buy like a forties, like whatever, <laughs> like, I don't know, because I want to. So, but yeah, I definitely, I guess like, I don't know. I, I, I had a plan to buy like a Mark II or even a Mark III, but I just fell in love with this particular one. It like spoke to me as metaphysical people would maybe say. <laughs> and John knows his stuff because he works oh, at he's, ARP. Yeah, so. He's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I just trusted it. So, so yeah. Good, good. All right. So, um... Oh, hi, Michelle. Is Michelle here? Is that Michelle Mo? It's hard to see who's here. I'm trying to see. All right. Um, so that's, I think that uh, answers are pretty well. So networking is the way to go. Um, we have time for maybe one more question before we're going to start to wind down. So I would uh, encourage anyone who has a question here to put it your way. Ah, there's Michelle. Michelle Moog is here. Hey, Michelle. Oh, that's so cool. So, um, 
So you mentioned before that you experienced a lot of sexism uh, in uh, your pre-Berkeley days. Uh, and do you find that, you know, you've gone from the frying pan into the fire? Because I've heard, you know, and there's been, uh, I don't know if this has um, been over-dramatized on television or not, but the gaming world is also a predominantly male uh, group. And, and have you experienced that or have you been, have you been able to make your way without any kind of hindrance on gender? Um, I definitely have experienced sexism post Berkeley as well. Um, and I think the thing is, is like, I think that people, so many, I shouldn't say people in general, but a lot of people um, have the idea that if you're a feminist and they're not a feminist, they think that feminism is, I don't want to work with men at all. And it's not that at all. It's like, you want to work with men who will respect you and make you feel something other, make you feel like a human being and not just like a piece of meat or something horrible. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, where I work now, now I work at Harmonix and I can say with like full certainly certainty, I've never been harassed or felt like someone was like being sexist at my job. They're so careful about who they hire. And that's like what every company should be doing. Just like, you know, gauge like people on their skill set but also gauge people on their character because who would want to work with someone who's making someone feel uncomfortable like um so yeah I mean I think that like with the me too movement uh, before the the me too movement happened I felt like a lot of times whenever I would bring up sexism that I experienced I, there would always be someone to be like well not all guys are like that and it's like no shit like obviously not like I mean it's like I'm my dad's my best friend right like the reason I am this way is because of values that I was raised with like right like obviously guys and all guys are like that like I wouldn't have a boyfriend if I felt like that I wouldn't have male friends if I felt like that but it's just it's the same thing that we're seeing now with um what's going on today how people ignore the fact that certain lives are being put at risk um people need to start focusing on issues at hand versus, I don't know, making someone ignore what's going on. So I think after the Me Too movement, like, uh, I think that, I don't know, it's it's hard to say, because I think that, like, we're in, like, different, like, phases of it almost. Like, I definitely think that there's a certain type of person who might maybe be more aware of the things that they say, and then they will be less likely to say them. But the real thing is, like, let's change the way that we're thinking as, like, a social group uh, versus like let's just like maybe not say them at all like so I don't know I, I definitely have like recognized that there are some sometimes when I play shows it's like little comments that maybe aren't meant to be sexist that are like where it's like oh like um like the first track off my album is called I didn't know girls can play guitar and it's kind of like oh is that supposed to be like a compliment like leave your house more if you didn't know that girls can play guitar like what can I like say to you but it's Stuff like that. I mean, I just, like, hope that we get to a day and age where it's, like, I'm not... I mean, I'm certainly who I am with my music and in general because of experiences I've gone through. So I can't say, like... I can't ignore that, but it is, like, a little bit annoying when it's, like, oh, like... I don't know. I don't know how to really, ex like, explain it. I think that we're... It's not as bad as it was. Um, and I hope that the next generation is better. I don't know. Maybe I'm still a little bit, like, jaded by some of the things that have happened, but... I think that it helps kind of construct us into a person too. Well, I think you're paving the way for some, you know, I, I love to speak to strong women synthesizer players that are also embracing their femininity at the same time. There's no reason why. Yeah. And a lot of people don't understand you can be feminine and a feminist at the same time. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah totally. Like I told you, I put on fake lashes like before this interview. <laughs> We're allowed to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we have a, a couple more. Uh, we have a question from Alex Ball. For your sound design, are you supplying a folder of assets or do you program them into the games too? Yeah. So for those demos that we looked at, um, those were synced up together and then exported out as like a movie, just as like a, a demo, I guess. And um, so something like that would happen if you were doing like a commercial or um yeah, just like a demo, like a something like that that might be played like to promote like PAX East or PAX West or whatever, like a different gaming uh, convention. Um, but so I've I've done both. Like so I've worked with any developers before who have said like, oh, can you make me these 50 sound effects? And they'd like write them out. They send me a video to reference 
And then I'd send them like the WAV files or FLAC files. We used to use FLAC and whatever. But um, a lot of times in game development, we actually use software called middleware. So some people use what's called FMOD. Some people use WISE or some people call it WISE. It's like WWISE. And um, so it's like an, an engine to sync together visuals, programming, and music so that when certain things can happen, certain assets are triggered. So if um, anyone's ever played like Ocarina of Time, like Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, if Link is going through like the field and it's like a sunny, beautiful day, and then all of a sudden a the sun goes down, it might trigger a bad guy to jump out of like the field, and then that will trigger um, different music to play. So that's what middleware does. It, it basically assesses the situation and plays relevant music and sound based on what's happening. Wow. So it's very technical. And for anyone getting into sound design, I would definitely say to learn middleware too, because if you ever apply to a job for sound design, they will ask you, do you know WISE or do you know FMOD or do you know Unity or do you know Unreal Engine? So definitely brush up on that. Very nice. Great. Uh, Than Silverlight says he'd be proud to have you as a granddaughter because he loves your ideas and overall feelings. That's so nice. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're getting close to the end. Um, and uh, just, are there any closing statements you would like to make? Um, I think that people should be supporting black people right now. Um, I think that's really important. And um, yeah, so... When I released my record, um, I said, you know, it's going to be available on Spotify for listening. It's available for listening for free on SoundCloud, too. I know this is like a hard time for people, so I'm never going to like just ask for money. But if people purchase through Bandcamp, I will be donating the proceeds to um, different foundations to help black people. So. Okay, great. And Bandcamp, do you have a Bandcamp account now? I know I put up your SoundCloud yes. and your website, but I didn't see the Bandcamp. So let me just put it now. Uh, is it... Um, Bandcamp. It's a, uh, oh my god. Yeah, it's the unicorn princess dot bandcamp dot com. Okay. Uh, slash, well, you'll find it. It's like, it's just called sugar. So it's it's at that link. Uh, I think I got, all right. Uh, typing in front of other people is always giving me anxiety. All right, I think that's what it is. <laughs> okay, so Alex Ball is really grateful for uh, your answers. Oh, yeah, definitely. Really, really, Anytime. Really, really happy. Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to close with um, uh, one of the pieces from Sugar. Um, and I apologize. I, I know it's about um, going back to Boston. And I didn't. Uh, can you just talk about this last song? Uh, and then uh, we'll call it a night. So. Yeah. So I was um, living in New York for a long time. And um, I think a lot of people talk about their successes so much. But I was there and I was, um, I applied to a residency with Electric Lady Studios and Spotify um, in Berkeley. It was like all like kind of this like mesh. And so I've always wanted to work for Electric Lady because Mark Ronson, he's like one of my favorite producers. Like he's like always there. It's like anytime you look at their Instagram, it's just like every famous person in the world is just there. And it's just like, oh my God, I want to like make like meaningful music. So I applied for a residency and I was one of the finalists, but I didn't end up getting it. And I was like completely bummed out and heartbroken for like a little while and then I wrote more music um but so I waited another year in New York uh in hopes that they would do the residency again and they actually discontinued the New York one but they're doing them I mean with the pandemic I don't know when it'll ever happen again but they were doing one in LA and there's one in London as well so if anyone if it's the they gear it towards um female and non-binary uh folks so um, if anybody is a producer and is trying to do that, definitely look on the Spotify EQL producer residency, um, residency. So, but yeah, I waited a year to see if they would, um, run it again and they didn't. And so I was in a long distance relationship at the time and, uh, he lives in Boston and I'm from Boston. I was very homesick. So kind of like, I don't know, it was just, I was so stressed out and like New York is hard and uh, whatever. So I made like the difficult decision to move back, but then I got some work and, yeah, I'll still visit New York. Not right now, because there's a pandemic, but someday. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. And yeah, thank you. It, this has been really great. And uh, I think you already sold some copies uh, of the 
CD and uh, it's going to a great cause. So uh, um, very, very grateful for your time. And thank you everyone thank for you. showing up. Um, I, we uh, Both Jamie and I felt it was imperative to honor Blackout Tuesday um, this past week um, in order to support our uh, our brethren, our people of color, our fam our greater family. And um, I really glad we did it. So everyone have a fantastic, fantastic weekend. Uh, stick around. I'm just going to play this last song and then there's some info about Jamie. All right. So thank you all and uh, sp see you soon. Oh, I thank just want to mention that next Tuesday uh, we'll be having our regular uh, scheduled broadcast and that's going to be with david mash that'll be a treat i think oh, cool i think he'll be playing a guitar through a synthesizer i'm not quite sure should be interesting all right <laughs> take care everyone thank you Bye -bye.